Welcome to the Talent Grow Show, where you can get actionable, results-oriented insight and advice on how to take your leadership, communication, and people skills to the next level and become the kind of leader people want to follow. And now, your host and leadership development strategist, Haleli Azulai. Welcome back to the Talent Grow Show. I'm Haleli Azulai, your leadership development strategist, and this week's episode features my friend and colleague, Jonathan B. Smith. He's an entrepreneur, author, certified EOS implementer, and founder and CEO of Chief Optimizer, where he helps entrepreneurs scale up beyond startup. But this episode is not just for entrepreneurs. This episode is for everyone because Jonathan shares a really wise idea that he describes in his writing in his book about the triangle of trusted advisors. He talks about who those three trusted advisors are, and how every single one of us not only needs them, but can totally afford them. Because there are a lot of ways to scale this to whoever you are, wherever you are in life. I think that you're going to really enjoy that idea. We also talk about his book in the podcast episode itself. When we recorded, we were talking about how the book is forthcoming, but I'm excited to tell you that I have a copy in my hand. It is on Amazon. It is an ebook, but also a soft cover book called Optimize for Growth, and you should definitely go get yourself a copy. Jonathan helps people get more control over their business and life. And I think that you're going to learn so much from him because he shares really actionable tips. So check out this episode. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, go and leave me comments so I can make the next episode exactly what you want it to be. Thanks. Hi, everyone. And welcome back. This is Halelia Zulai. And this is the Talent Grow Show. This time, I am very pleased to present my guest, Jonathan B. Smith. This is a guy I am really happy to introduce you to. He's an entrepreneur, an author, and a certified EOS implementer, which I think that you'll learn maybe a little more about what that means. It's an it's a system for entrepreneurs to stay on top of their stuff. Jonathan is the founder and CEO of Chief Optimizer, where he helps entrepreneurs scale up beyond startup. And in his very impressive resume, you will also learn that he formerly was the chief operating officer of an Inc. 500 company and helped scale that business from $500,000 to $15 million in five years. I am very impressed by that. I met Jonathan through a mutual colleague of ours who suggested that I speak with Jonathan and I'm really pleased that she did. And John and Finn and I have actually shared a few conversations about running an entrepreneurial business and leadership. And I wanted to make sure that you got a chance to learn a lot about leadership from Jonathan. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining me on the Talent Grow Show and welcome. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Great. One of the things that I want to make sure we do before we get into the meat of the conversation is for people to get a sense of your professional journey. And it's always very hard to put it into a brief format because you've done so much. But if you could encapsulate where you've been, how you got to where you are today in just a couple of short minutes, I think that that would be really valuable. So when I came out of school, I thought I was going to be an entrepreneur and my dad managed to go bankrupt. So (laughs) not not knowing what I should do, I went and got a degree in uh, accounting. I actually have an undergraduate degree in liberal arts and I have a master's degree in accounting and a liberal arts degree undergraduate. So I can use both sides of my brain, work at Arthur Anderson as an accountant for a couple of years, realized that's not what I wanted to do. Worked on Wall Street for a couple of years and then transitioned to my entrepreneurial journey. Built a uh, web development firm and saw that get crushed in 2001 with the dot-com crash. Learned search engine optimization by hand because more people were calling for search engine optimization in 2001 than were calling for web development. Ultimately, used those skills to create my 500 business called WhisperWave. And uh, a couple of years ago, I transitioned to becoming an EOS implementer. And at this point, I'm helping other entrepreneurs get what they want from their business to scale up beyond startups. So I don't tend to work with startups. I tend to work with what I call scale-ups, who are businesses from about 2 to 50 million with 10 to 250 employees who are growth-oriented open-minded, appreciative, respectful, and frustrated and want some help to uh, 
to break through the ceiling and get to the next level. Very cool. And it's really nice to hear. I, I know that you are very clear about who you want to work with and the way that you describe it is, is really easy to understand. That's from, from a marketing perspective. I am not an expert of marketing, but I am a student of marketing. And so that I think is extremely valuable for people to kind of know if they fit the description or not. You know, recently I follow what you put out through through LinkedIn and through your blog. You you publish and you share a lot of knowledge. And one uh, recent blog post that you wrote was really interesting about how every CEO really needs to have a triangle of trusted advisors. And so most of the people that listen to this podcast, I don't think are CEOs, although maybe they are entrepreneurs. And they're usually going to be people that are in a leadership position within an organization or that are aspiring to become leaders and want to take their leadership skills up to the next level. And I think that a lot of what you wrote in that blog actually applies to any leader in any profession. I would love for you to share a little bit about that with folks, uh, the three trusted advisors, and maybe help connect that to people in leadership positions everywhere. Sure. So in working with over 50 entrepreneurial businesses, what I've found is the best businesses I work for, the best CEOs I work with, they have three different types of advisors. They have a coach or a mentor to help them with their personal issues, just help them become better versions of themselves. Someone who's actually walked in their shoes before them and can actually share the experiences and the mistakes and the opportunities for growth without having to share that level of basically, they don't necessarily want to share that with their team, but they can share that with this coach. They can have a a trusted relationship there. The second thing I've seen is peer advisory. So peer advisory, in my mind, could be a group like EO or YPO or Vistage. Those are groups where you sit down with 8 to 16 people a month and talk about, basically, you have a trusted board of advisors who are in generally non-competing businesses or non-competing geographies, and they actually are able to share their experiences with you as you go through the process. But what I've also seen is that within organizations, if, for example, you're a general manager of a operation within, and there's a bunch of folks who run offices across the country, there's a great opportunity to share the wisdom that you found or share your experience. So any kind of peer group where you're sitting with peers and you can help each other get to the next level, I found that to be really helpful. And the third thing is an operating system. So If you have a coach who's helping you personally and you have a a peer group that's helping you network and come up with new ideas, you have to have some way of onboarding those ideas with your team. So I call that an operating system. It's a means of executing on the strategy you've created. If you just come back from your peer group and you just tell your team, gee, we should try this new thing, the team often will push back and say, we have so much already going on. You know, we don't want to hear anything new. An operating system allows you to to basically compartmentalize and prioritize those new ideas and actually figure out how to execute on the two of 20 that are great ideas that are going to move the business forward. So that's what I call my triangle of trusted advisors. And that's really, you know, it seems to me like every person just actually needs to have that, right? I mean, not, you don't have to pay an executive coach you can find a mentor that will work with you without any charge. You don't have to pay, uh, you know, a thousand dollars a month or whatever some of those organizations cost. You can find some kind of a mastermind group, a peer group that is people who match you and and volunteer to meet with each other once a month. And certainly creating some kind of a, a system to help operationalize your ideas and your strategies is something that pretty much anyone can can incorporate. So those are such, I think that those are such good ideas. And I find that, you know, including myself, most people don't really have all three in place, if any, right? They just sort of do their best, but they kind of go with the flow and maybe improvise through life and through their challenges of leadership. Do you find that to be the case? 
you know, I find that they, they almost fall into success or failure. Just, they just fall into it. So interestingly, some of the highest performing executives that I know have a coach or a mentor. So like, for example, the, the Small Business Administration has a program called SCORE that retired executives help coach other businesses, businesses through. And when you say you don't have to pay a coach, it's true. You don't have to pay a coach. You just have to find someone who cares enough about you that you can have a confidential conversation about some of those demons that you're dealing with in your head. And you think you're the only one. And the reality is there's lots of other people who are fighting that battle too. Yeah. And in terms of, yeah. So the peer network, it even works in terms of um, like small groups at church are a form of a peer network or a meetup group that you just find online is a form of a, a peer network. The peer network itself just needs to be small enough that you can get to know each of the people in the group and you can trust them so that you can share at a much at a more intimate level than you would in a larger group. Yeah. And was it, not to put you on the spot, but was it Dale Carnegie who wrote this or what was in, in the How to Win Friends and Influence People? Was that? No. no, no yeah, no. that was Dale Carnegie. Yeah. Or, or in Napoleon Hill and Think and Grow Rich. One of those, I think, like one of those classic books suggests that you have some kind of a, a mastermind or a peer advisory group, you know, going back like a hundred years. It's such an important concept. This is, this is not a new idea. This is just an idea that, of how to organize it in a different way and how to think of it a little bit differently. So all of a sudden that conversation you're having with your coach from football or your, your, your father or you know, someone you just have trusted in the world, that could be your mentor coach relationship. And uh, it's just a matter of reframing how you think it and being disciplined about putting those pieces in place. And one of the things I say is it's a continuum. It, you don't necessarily start with a coach and then go to a peer group and then go to an operating system. It happens somewhere. My, I've had clients who've started in each area, and the idea is we just want to strengthen all three. And that's actually how you can break through the ceiling. Yeah. And you've seen some amazing results with some of your clients, right? And once they implement a system like this with your help, it really just completely takes their business to a new level. That's the goal. My goal is to uh, basically put my clients in more control of their business and their lives and secondly, increase the value of their business. So I have had a number of very significant financial exits and I've actually also seen clients where husband and wife are getting better, along better, family members are getting along better, people decide to leave and you know, choose a different path, but that new path actually works better for them instead of struggling in an untenable situation. So I, I've just seen amazing growth on the parts of my clients. Such important work. And I know that you've recently put it all together or a lot of what you uh, espouse into an ebook that is coming out very soon, or maybe it will probably be out already by the time that this uh, podcast hits the airwaves, right? You're calling it Optimize for Growth, How to Scale Up Your Business, Your Network, and You. So tell me more about the book. I'm so excited about it. Who is it for? What, what is it about? And what problem does it help the readers solve? Well, it was originally written for my target market client, the one I described earlier, which is a high growth business, growth oriented business, 10 to 250 employees, two to 50 million in revenues. But like every entrepreneurial venture, you never really know who the audience is until you publish the book. Yeah. So as you and I, for example, today started having this conversation and your, your market is not necessarily entrepreneurial CEOs, the book still works for um, an executive in a corporate environment who's looking to scale themselves up with a coach and a peer group and an operating system to execute. So it'll be interesting to see how it evolved. Originally it was, it was, it was written for, my uh, target market, but we'll see what happens. Very cool. And so how is the book organized or what, what do you think is, is the main way that it'll help people? Um, the way it's organized is first and foremost, it just talks about the general problems that people have in terms of hitting the ceiling. Mm. The fact that 
you're having people problems. How do you deal with all those people issues and decide who's the right person in the right seat? It talks about profitability. There just doesn't seem to be enough. What do we do about that? Systems. We can't get people to follow the system. Why won't they follow the systems? We tried lots of stuff and there doesn't seem to be a silver bullet. Why is it, why is it not working? And, and you're just so frustrated in looking for a solution. So it, it's really written around that concept and then saying, Hey, there's actually these three pillars that can actually help you. So I've actually had clients where they're there. I'm involved with the entrepreneurial operating system with them. And I'm saying, you really need a peer group. You keep calling me with these issues. And I, at some point I come to a point where I don't have ex- enough experience in that area to help you go get a peer group of 16 other entrepreneurial executives and they will help you. They've been through something similar. Or I say, you personally need some growth in this area. I really think you should have a coach and they can help you get there. So it's built around those three, three pillars. And then it basically, it has a, an assessment in it to basically say, how strong are you in each of those three pillars? And based on that assessment, you can actually make some decisions about what area you may want to improve first, because isn't life all about prioritization and uh, limited amount of resources and energy and then figuring out you know, where you can get the greatest gain and the least amount of effort. So that's why I put the assessment together. Oh, good. Well, I think people will love the, I generally people love assessments, but that's very helpful because it is sometimes, you know, really overwhelming, right? So you know that you need help and all of the things sound like, oh, I guess I need help with that and I need help with that. And then so you don't, you don't know where to start or if it feels really too much, then sometimes people get into like paralysis, right? And they do nothing. So I think that you're, you're right on for putting that in there and helping people kind of prioritize and start somewhere instead of trying to do everything. Just do something. That's <laughs> usually what I say. <laughs> say something. Yeah, that's true. Oh, God, it's so helpful. Well, when you meet with a lot of these leaders of fast, explosive growth companies, I know that, as you just said, they have people problems. And of course, that's something that is near and dear to my heart. Not problems, but people. (laughs) And a lot of the time that I spend with my clients and and in in organizations and on this podcast and on my blog is trying to help leaders deal with their the people side of the house, you know, how, how do they optimize their teams and how to make sure that their teams are productive and motivated and effective. And for, uh, in your system, I know that, that having the right people in the right seats on the bus and having the right team and managing it is something that you definitely pay a lot of attention to. Are there really common mistakes, maybe one, two or three mistakes that you find that leaders are making in their approach to running a productive and effective team? And what do you suggest that they do for those mistakes? What typically works? What I see is that leaders often kick the can down the road with their their most challenging people. So they'd rather ignore the issue and actually get to the heart of it and and have the difficult conversations. Mm. So what I find is that I, I have this saying, I'm like, so we're going to deal with this person this quarter, next quarter, or the quarter after? Because we're going to eventually deal with this. Right. We've now spent how many times talking about this person and the fact that you can't get them to do what you ask them to do. So I, I see it time and time again. That it's basically, you know, just avoidance or like, the ostrich syndrome. Let's just ignore it and hope it gets better. Definitely. And that is really, oh, it's so common. Why are people so afraid of it? I think a lot of people are afraid of confrontation mm-hmm. and they don't have a structured way to have the conversation and they don't have a structured way to measure people. I, I often find that the performance uh, review process is highly, highly flawed because it happens once a year and we haven't necessarily set people's expectations going on during the course of the year and had those conversations. So one of the things in the office we do is we have quarterly conversations and we have quarterly conversations and we are very clear during those conversations. Here are our core values. Here's what uh, this company exudes. It's how we hire. It's how we fire. It's how we promote and how we reward. And here's how we feel that you're doing relative to those core values. What are the, 
what does that mean? We're saying, are you, you know, when you come into the office, are you fully engaged? Are you good with the clients, et cetera? Um, so what's the core values fit? We call that right people. What, what did we expect you to do this quarter? Like, what are your goals? We call those rocks for the quarter. How'd you do on your rocks and your performance? We're going to hold you accountable to it. And hopefully you're going to, going to achieve what we set out to do. And the last piece is what's your role? We'll get real clear on what your role is. Here's the five things you have, as opposed to a lengthy job description that's three pages long and we're never quite sure if you hit all of them or if we go through a hundred hundred item checklist, we can check the list. But the reality is no human being can actually deal with a hundred checklist items and make sure they're doing it on a day to day basis. So what we actually do is break it down to what we call get it, want it, have the capacity. That's how we figure out if people are in the right seat. Do they get it? Does all the fiber and all the DNA in their bodies get what it takes to do that job. They either do or they don't. And if they don't, it's okay. They just need to be in a different role. Do they want it? Are they willing to do what it takes to win? Do they have the capacity? Are they trained? Do they have the time? Do they have the emotional capacity to do the particular job they're in? Get it has to be yes. Want it has to be yes. And capacity can be yes or no. And if it's no, we have to be willing to put the time in to, in fact, train them to that capacity. So we do that quarterly. And then by the time we get to the annual review, no one's surprised. Everyone knows where they stand. So that's what I found with people. And if you structure the conversation that way, it makes it a lot easier. It's a program decision. It's clear how it's going to happen as opposed to, oh, gosh, we have that, that difficult conversation and I'm not sure how to start it. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and I, I can't agree with you more about the the way that many companies are doing performance management is just so ineffective. And if you do wait for that annual surprise conversation, both sides are dreading it. Both sides have, hate every minute of it, and it doesn't have the intended effect at all. So I agree with you and, and kudos to you for creating that kind of structure. And I think that that's something that probably helps your clients a ton. And I think that the listeners here can really implement a lot of insights from, from that. So thank you for sharing it. And so I know that working on a book is a very big deal, having done it a couple of times. And so congratulations for, for being one of those people who actually wrote a book rather than wanted to write a book. Uh, that puts you in probably what, like the top 5% or the top 1%. And now that that's behind you, I imagine that you'll be uh, launching into book marketing mode. But aside from that, what is new and exciting for you? What's on your horizon? Any new project or, or new research or anything that you are really excited about right now? So I'm certainly excited about the book, but the book is almost done. So I need something else to to wrap my head around. One of the things that I'm pretty excited about and I've seen consistently an issue with my clients is talent management. So the, the topic is, is the war for talent slowing your growth? And actually helping my clients figure out what the model is to do talent acquisition. Because what, what tends to happen, I see in my leadership teams is, oh, we need to go hire this person. Oh, let's take this really successful salesperson and we're going to make them spend their time going to find the right person for that job. And the reality is I want to, I put a process in place for how, how to deal with that talent acquisition, which goes from marketing the job to doing the phone, to, to screening the resumes, to doing the phone screen, to having interviews, to onboarding that per person. And what we found is the biggest, uh, limitation in the process is how our clients define what they want in potential candidates. Because the recruiters I've talked to have said, we'll bring the people based on the profile you give, gave us. And then you start interviewing people and then you start changing the profile wow. and the uh, time it takes to get the people. So I'm working on that and kind of excited about is the war for talent slowing your growth. Wow. Yeah. So that's a little bit of uh, a new area of expertise for you a little bit. Uh, it's obviously related to what you've been doing, but it takes 
a deeper dive into this one aspect. And I think that a lot of companies really do struggle with this, you know, how to get the right people. Wow. That should be very helpful. So kudos. And, and I look forward to hearing more about that. So one uh, last thing before I ask you for, to share how to, how folks can keep in touch with you that I really try to make sure every one of my guests shares at the end of the podcast in the podcast conversation is a specific action that you can recommend that listeners can take today or tomorrow or this week that they can do something they can do that will upgrade their leadership skills based on your expertise and your experience. What do you think is one actionable takeaway that people can implement? So I feel that in a world of constant interruption, taking the opportunity to enjoy the silence is really important. So the, the idea of, it, it comes in a couple different ways. One is take a clarity break, go for a walk at lunch, go for a bike ride on the weekends, you know, take vacation, take the time to, to go, go away so that you can just give yourself a little bit of space. And in conjunction with that, turn your cell phones off when you're in a meeting. Put it away and be present when you're in that meeting. And you're, you're, the people who work with you will be most grateful. I can't believe when I'm in corporate America now, you're sitting there and everyone's on an email while someone else is talking. It's the ultimate, hey, I don't really care what you're saying. I just have to be in this meeting. If you want to be a great leader, you need to be present. Yeah. So that would be my, my thoughts. Oh my God. It's such a pet peeve of mine. And here's what I, what I find actually, I could, you know, I see this all the time and I talk to people about it. So w what happens is first of all, at, not only is it important for you to be present, but it's also important for you to model the proper behavior. And so actually what's happening is the opposite, which is people come in and into an organization, especially people who are, are newer into the professional arena and they have a certain set of, of rules in their mind about how to be courteous and how to be professional. And I'm pretty sure one of them is, you know, if you're in a meeting with people, you're supposed to pay attention to the people in the meeting and not to your device. And then you notice that the people, the other people in the room, especially if the leaders are doing it, in a way it sends this message. And I hear this all the time from people who say, you know, it seemed like that's what everybody does. It seemed like it's okay. I didn't think it was okay. At first I was really surprised by it. But because it seemed like that's the way we do things around here, then I kind of joined in. And it just sort of exacerbates the problem because everybody becomes so entrenched in the behavior. It's so much harder to pull back from it after you've created a, a habit. Yeah, we say as goes the leadership team, so goes the rest of the organization. Completely, so. completely. I had this one, I'll tell you a little story. One time I was uh, facilitating a, a congressionally appointed commission that had two days to make really important decisions about the report that they were going to submit to Congress. And these are eight people with huge egos, huge resumes. You know, each one of them thinks that he or she is the most important one on that commission. And they had to listen to each other and come to agreement with 50 of their senior staff sitting in the back of this room. So we made a ground rule and we knew that they would be, you know, on their devices all the time because they're very important people and people contact them all the time. So how would they be present for two full days and actually give their attention and their brain power so we can get this decision done and, and for them to actually do what they needed to do. So I made a ground rule for you're not allowed to be on your device as I often do in these kinds of facilitations, but we uh, made it a little bit more interesting than, than just making it a ground rule on a flip chart. And I brought in a rubber chicken, you know, there's a uh, gag gift. I brought in a rubber chicken and I said, okay, so whoever is seen pulling out his or her device and using it, the chicken is put on his or her desk and you guys get to monitor that, right? So they were peer policing and they loved it. They just loved giving that chicken to each other. And in the end, it, for, it backfired because they were like trying to talk to me in the breaks about taking the chicken home to their kids. Like, you're not supposed to covet the thing. You're supposed to just... <laughs> 
<laughs> avoided, but it worked. So maybe we can make some kind of a you know rubber chicken rule across corporate the corporate world, and maybe then our all our problems will be gone. I hope so. Well, it's been fun talking with you, Jonathan, and I think that it's been extremely valuable. I I know that people listening have learned a lot from you, as I always do. And so where can they learn more about you and how, to, how can they stay in touch with you before we wrap this up? So it's uh, Chief Optimizer. The website's Chief Optimizer, C-H-I-E-F-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R.com. It's Chief Optimizer on uh, Twitter also. Very good. And um, I will have the show notes on the same page when I publish this podcast. So we'll link to... Uh, your website and to your book and everything else. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you sharing your knowledge and I hope that you make it a great day, Jonathan. Well, thank you, Haleli. I appreciate it and I hope everyone stays focused. Yes, I love that. You always sign your emails that way. Stay focused. All right, people, stay focused. Take care. Did you love it? I love how very practical Jonathan is. I think that he really breaks things down in a way that makes sense and is easy to implement. And I hope that you're going to go and take action that Jonathan suggested there at the end. Enjoy the silence. Take some time and space away. And for goodness sake, turn the cell phones off in meetings and be present. All right, everybody. Just like we said in the episode, stay focused and check out the show notes where all the links can be found to Jonathan's book, to Jonathan's website, to Jonathan's blog, to ways to stay connected with Jonathan. And did you know that you can stay connected with me, that I have a free bi-weekly newsletter that goes out that's easy to read. It's very quick. It always has an actionable tip. It always has links to the podcast, to my blogs, to where I am, to things I'm doing, and lots of insights you can use. It's very fast to read. People are telling me that they like the, the humor and kind of light touch to it. So if you're not getting that, let's change that. Go on my website, sign up, And I hope to see you on the next episode of the Talent Grow Show and also on the next issue of my newsletter. Thanks for tuning in. I appreciate you. Make today great. Thanks for listening to the Talent Grow Show, where we help you develop your talent to become the kind of leader that people want to follow. For more information, visit talentgrow.com.